أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم في أستري سورة الكهف and have reached آية نمبر 92 بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ثم أتبع سببا and حضرت الكريم عليه السلام he again took one of those extraordinary means which Allah had bestowed upon him and he traveled in another direction now, this time around, Allah Ta'ala is not telling us which direction did he travel in. Did he go east or west? Previously, we know he went to the west first and then to the east. But this time, Allah Ta'ala is not mentioning. It could be north, it could be south, it could be northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest. It could be any direction. It could be the same direction as before. We could again go to the west or east. But Allah Ta'ala is keeping quiet because he does not want to give this information. And later on, we will find out why Allah Ta'ala has not given this information. Hatta iza balaga bayna saddaini wajada min dune hima kauman la yakaduna yafkahuna kaula. Till when he reached a place between two mountain barriers, he found beneath them a people who could scarcely understand a word. So this is interesting. He has traveled very far. How do we know he's traveled very far? Why do I say he's traveled very far? Now, there's a general principle of language. And the principle of language is that after every six miles, the pronunciation and the way the language is spoken changes a bit. Every six miles. I mean, nowadays we've got a very cosmopolitan society and people have moved around a lot. But if you go to traditional societies where villages are apart from each other and there's not a lot of mingling, you would see a pattern of languages that every six miles there's slight difference in the language. And when you move on, like 40 miles, the language starts to change. Now, he has reached a place where they cannot understand a single word of his language. Now, I'd like to give you an example of how far he has traveled. If you start from the Indian subcontinent, and I'm talking about the region of Pakistan, we speak languages which are known as Urdu, Punjabi, Hindko, Pashto. You move on to Afghanistan and you've got Pashto there. A lot of words are common between these languages. If you move on further, you come to Iran, which has got Persian. And many words between Persian and Urdu are common. But the commonality starts to drop. So in Iran, they have the same words for uh, earth and heaven, Zameen, Osman, they would pronounce it differently. They say Osman. And whereas in uh, Pakistan, they would say Asman. And you keep moving on. You go to Italy. And the Italian language is quite different from the language of the subcontinent. But there are odd words which are very common, especially nouns. Nouns and numbers, they change less. Verbs and adjectives often change. Now, in Italy lang Italian language, uh, in Latin, the word for uh, the knee, which is like uh, the joint in the leg, it is genu. And in traditional uh, Hindko and Punjabi language of Pakistan, the word genu is still used. So there's a commonality here. You move further on, you reach areas of Germany and the Germanic languages in Northern Europe. And the commonality reduces further. But you do find words which are very common. For example, in uh, Germanic languages, the word for mother is matar. And in English, it's mother. And in Persian, in uh, Pashto, and in Urdu, the lafz madar is used. So imagine, madar, matar, mother. Similarly, the word for brother is brother. And in Persian and Pashto and Urdu, you have brother. In fact, uh, I think currently the leader of the Taliban in Afghanistan is Mullah brother. So, commonality in the language seen here. Move further on. Go to the very end of Europe. Celtic languages. You come to Wales. Very far western end of uh, England. And you have this Welsh community which are Celtics tribe which settled in England 3,500 years ago you would find little, little common things in the language. Almost none. But there are some hints. The language is so different. I'll give you an example that in English, uh, we say good morning. And in Welsh, they say burida. Now, 
absolutely nothing common between a good morning and a bure da. But in the Welsh language, sister is called khoyr. In Pashto, sister is called khor. In Welsh language, the number three is called tre. In Punjabi, the number three is called tre. In Welsh language, the number five is called panj. In Punjabi, the number five is called panj. In Welsh language, now this is Celtic language, 3,500 years old, nothing common with English, very few things common with English. The number seven is called Sait. And number seven in Punjabi is called Sait. And number nine is called No. And number nine is called No in Punjabi language. So imagine there is like thousands of miles between Punjab in Pakistan and between uh, the Pashto-speaking communities. And yet these people which went 3,500 years ago and settled in the farthest corners of Europe still have common nouns and numbers with these languages. But where Hazrat Zulkarnain has gone, says not even a single word is common. So this is a measure of distance. Allah Ta'ala, in a very subtle way, is showing you how far he's gone. Every six mile pronunciation is changing. Every 40 miles language is changing. Now, how far did Zulkarnain al-Islam have to go to reach these people between two mountain passes? where nothing is common with his language. It's almost a different language group, a different linguistic group. In modern day, if you travel to South Africa and you go to the Bantu tribe in South Africa, they speak a language called Kosa. But the Kosa language comes with a click. They have clicks in the language. The consonants are clicks, like, like this kind of sound. I can't make it very good. They are expert at that. And they combine vowels with clicks to make words. And that would make no sense to you and me. So if me and you went to South Africa and we spoke to them our language and they spoke to us our, uh, their language, it will make absolutely no sense. So that is the kind of difference that Zulkarnan al-Islam came across. He had traveled so far. Next ayah. قَالُوا يَا ذَلْكَرْنَيْنِ إِنَّ يَا جُوجَ وَمَعْجُوجَ مُفْسِدِونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَهَلْ نَجْعَلُوا لَكَ خَرْجًا عَلَىٰ أَن تَجْعَلَ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَهُمْ سَدَّ They said, O Zulkarnain, O two-horned one, Behold, Yajuj and Majuj, Gog and Magog, are spoiling this land. May we they then pay to you a tribute on the understanding that you will erect a barrier between us and them. Three things here. Number one, Kalu, they said, but we just said they can't understand each other. And Western uh, scholars, they have criticized a lot. And they said, oh, how could, how could he understand them? When you say there's not a single word is matching, how do you understand that? Well, I'd say, how would you understand someone speaking Tosa language in South Africa? You get a person from the ne- nearby tribe who speaks a language which is common with yours. You get someone who speaks Afrikaans or someone who speaks English or someone who speaks uh, Zulu. So whenever kings used to travel, especially with, especially with armies, they used to have local interpreters. They would pick interpreters on from localities wherever they went. They would even hire people in the army with la- language skills. So when you reach someone who's very far from you, you do have their adjacent countries and tribe people as interpreter among your army who can understand their language and they have know-how of your language and they translate between the two. So it's very simple. It was very commonly done and there is no controversy here. Now, they have, they've been able to communicate to Zulkanan. Kalu, they've said to Zulkanan. And what have they said? That... Yajuj and Majuj, they are called causing fasad. They are spoiling the land. And uh, we've talked about it yesterday that Yajuj and Majuj, they are the tribe which originated from the son Yafis of Nuh salam, And they do not have the same kind of culture and society that we have. They are more like a consuming culture, culture which is based on consuming everything, destroying everything and just surviving for the day. They do not care what will happen in the future. 
they do not have a sustainable existence. It's a non-sustainable existence. You know what we are doing to the environment now? Destroying the environment and just taking, taking, taking from the environment, cutting down the forests, destroying the water supplies. They do it at a very alarming rate, a very alarming rate. They are much way ahead of us in destruction. So these people are saying, فَهَلْ نَجْعَلُ لَكَ خَرْجًا أَلَا أَن تَجْعَلَ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَهُمْ سَدَّ would we be able to give you some sort of tribute, yearly income, pay you every year, pay you money, and you would erect a barrier between them and us? Now, remember the word used here is sadda, which is barrier and also used for walls. So that is what they propose. But Hazrat Zulkarnal al-Islam, he has a different plan. He says, Qala, said Zulkarnayn al-Islam, Ma makkanni fihi rabbi khayrun fa'a'inuni bi kuwwatin aj'al baynakum wa baynahum radma. So he answered that wherein my Rabb, my sustainer, has so securely established me, it is better. Hence, do but help me with your strength, like with your labor strength and I shall erect a rampart between you and them. So Zulkarnayn al-Islam is saying, I'm very blessed by Allah, alhamdulillah. He has established me on this earth. He has given me a lot of wealth, a lot of power, and I would not charge you. You are in trouble. You are having a problem. I would help you. But I need help from you in numbers and strength. So he is envisioning a mega project. He is planning a mega, mega, mega project. And that project is so big that Zulkarnayn al-Islam himself can't do it. And if he has any army or any people with him, they are not enough to do it. Because this project is going to be twofold. First of all, they'll have to hold back the Yajuj and Majuj so they don't come out. Secondly, they'll have to construct a barrier. But remember, the people, they said Sadda. It's like a barrier and a wall. But Zulkarnayn al-Islam says, I'll make for you a Radma. A radma is like a rampart. It is like an embankment. So his plan is slightly different from their plans. And you'll see how this is different. And I think the confusion which has, arise, uh, which has arisen over the centuries is that people have focused on the sadda part of the previous ay ayah, which was the idea floated by the local people of what to do with Jajuj and Majuj. And everyone is obsessed with that sadda part the wall part, and they keep confusing walls all over, the, all over the world, whether it's the Great Wall of Gorgan or the Great Wall of China. They all say this is the structure which uh, Hazrat Zulkarnayn has made. But Hazrat Zulkarnayn, even in this eye, Allah Ta'ala is showing, is planning something different from a wall. He is planning a radma. And he needs a lot of manpower for that. And then he says, Atuni Zubr al Hadid. Bring me ingots of iron. Hatta iza sawa baynas sadafaini qalan fukhu. Then after he had piled up the iron and filled the gap between the two mountains, between the two mountain sides, he said, ply your bellows, which means light a fire and then blow hard on it. Hatta iza ja'alahu naran qala atuni ufrig alayhi kitra. Till, at length, when he had made it fire, it, he had made it glow like fire. So the whole iron was like fire. You know, when you see this iron foundries, they heat the iron till it becomes like fire. It is glowing like fire. And when that has happened, he commanded, bring me molten copper, which I may pour upon it. So he's mixing iron and copper. So mixing of iron and copper basically is not going to be a chemical reaction. But what Hazrat Zulkarnayn is doing is creating an alloy. And the advantage of an alloy is that it doesn't rust. So he's making something very durable, which will last for a very long period of time. And that is according to the orders of Allah. And the next ayah says, فَمَسْتَطَعُوا أَنْ يَزْهَرُوهُ وَمَسْتَطَعُوا لَهُ نَقْبَ and thus they, that is the Yajuj and Majuj, were 
unable to scale it and neither were they able to pierce it. So they can't climb on top of it and they can't make a hole through it. So what he's done is he's covered the gap between the two mountains till the top, till the hilt. And he's covered it with molten iron and that has been combined with copper to make an alloy. Now, over the centuries, there's going to be dust and snow and storms and uh, different environmental factors which would cover this iron-copper alloy thing. It would be covered, buried under sand and dust and probably snow depending on what kind of area that is where these two mountains are. So we cannot find it and we cannot identify it as a man-made structure between the two mountains. If you're looking from far, even if you look up close, go to that area, what we would see is just a continuous mountain, not knowing that actually there is a gap in between which has been filled. And Yajuj and Mahajuj are trapped behind that mountain. The mountain pass is closed and they're trapped behind now, what is behind there? Behind there is a valley. And from Ahadith and other uh, rawayat and other descriptions, we know that this valley does have a sustainable source of water for them to live. So there's a flowing river which brings water to them. And through that river, they probably also are able to get some food and fish. And they might be able to have some provisions, some vegetation and some uh, wild animals uh, in that valley, they might have domesticated them. But their numbers would be limited by the food provided. That's the basic principle of population. And inshallah, in the next ayah, we'll study and we'll know that in future when they come out and they find ample food and provisions, they grow exponentially. Like cancer cells spread and grow. That's how they are going to spread and grow. And then they will take over the planet or almost all of the planet. And inshallah, we'll talk about it later. So till then, inshallah, uh, please remember everyone in your prayers. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.